recognize the official uh, mem uh, leader of the opposition. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. This afternoon, thousands of people from all across Ontario are coming to Queen's Park to stand up for public health care. They're standing up for seniors who are being charged thousands of dollars for cataract surgery, for patients that are being charged an annual fee just to get primary care. The minister knows that these practices are illegal under the Canada Health Act, but she refuses to investigate or take action. Instead, she's blaming patients, Speaker, saying that extra billing is their own, quote, misunderstanding. So how many misunderstandings need to happen before this Premier finally stands up for patients? I recognize the Parliamentary Assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Each year, our government invests nearly $50 million to connect hundreds of thousands of Ontarians to primary care through 25 nurse practitioner-led clinics across the province. Speaker, Ontario is the first jurisdiction to use the nurse practitioner-led clinic model of care, and we will continue to use this innovative way of delivering publicly funded primary care to connect hundreds of thousands of people across the province to the care they need. Speaker, this year we invested a record $110 million to create 78 new and expanded interprofessional primary care teams. And in this year's budget, which the opposition voted against, we've expanded that to $546 million over the next three years to uh, another 600,000 Ontarians to receive primary care. Speaker, while the opposition continues to stand in the way of our innovative ways of delivering publicly funded health care, we will continue to do what's needed to get the job done for the people of Ontario. Supplementary, I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Speaker, innovative? Right? That's, that's code for privatizing our health care system. That's what it is. And I, I, you know, there are busloads of people that are coming here to get answers from this premier and this minister. And at the same time, there's going to be rallies all across the province in Ottawa and Cornwall, Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, Dryden, Thunder Bay. I hope the government has some answers because patients and families and our overworked and overburdened healthcare workers have had enough. Hospital departments closed, emergency rooms closed, urgent care clinics closed. While this government enriches their shareholder friends, Ontarians are literally paying for it. So, Speaker, what is this government going to do to protect public health care, or are we going to see more pay for it health care? So, recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Speaker, if somebody is wrongfully charged for health care services, we will investigate it, Speaker. That has always been the case. But, Speaker, we're investing a record $85 billion into our publicly funded health care system this year, which is a 30 per cent increase when we took office in 2018, Speaker. Speaker, we've invested into our primary care expansion of $546 million over the next three years to expand our primary care to another 600,000 Ontarians, Speaker. We're also investing in hospital infrastructure with over 50 projects underway with $50 billion associated with that. Speaker, Ontario has the most internationally educated nurses in Canada, with internationally trained nurses now making up 41% of the new application to the College of Nurses. Speaker, in Ontario, we have a plan and it's working, and the opposition Pause. will continue to vote against our plan, Speaker. I recognize the leader of the official opposition. Speaker, the, the, the member is right about that. We'll keep voting against the privatization of health care every single time. Uh, the government keeps repeating the same line over and over again that you know people are paying with their health card, not their credit card, but it's simply not the case. You will, as Ontarians, have to pay for this, and you're already doing it. Countless of publicly reported examples of patients who are having to pay for upgrades before they're eligible for OHIP covered services in private clinics. Over and over again, it's happening right now and it's costing patients, it's costing their families, and it's happening at a time when the cost of living has become absolutely unbearable for most people. So, Speaker, I'm going to ask the Premier again, why is this Premier expanding pay-for-it health care? Thank you, Speaker. I don't think I need to remind this House that the Leader of the Opposition was a Bob Ray staffer who actually 
eliminated 10 percent of medical residency seats in the province of Ontario, Speaker. That's thousands of less physicians that would be practicing in Ontario today, Speaker. Last year, we registered 2,400 new physicians, with 1,000 of them being internationally trained, Speaker, which the opposition voted against. Speaker, Ontario is the first province to have a publicly funded nurse practitioner-led clinic. In addition, the new Practice Ready Ontario program will add 50 physicians this year, Speaker. The new and expanded teams are the results of a province-wide call for proposals that took place in 2023, Speaker. Ontario leads the country in how many people benefit from a long-term, stable relationship with a family doctor or primary care provider, Speaker. Since 2018, Response. the province has added over 80,000 new nurses and 12,500 new physicians, which is actually outpacing the growth of the province, Speaker. Excellent. The questions are recognized. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Yesterday, uh, when the MPP from Parkdale High Park asked the minister to fix a school in her riding where kids are wading in deep puddles, the Minister of Education pointed fingers, he blamed the school board, he said it wasn't his responsibility. I was in a school just uh, a few days ago, last week, when I asked grades four and five kids what their dreams are for their school. I asked them if they could have anything at all in this school. What would they want? And you know what they said? They said, can you bring back the soap in the soap dispensers? That's what their dreams are right now, Speaker. That is the state of education in the province of Ontario right now. No soap, leaky roofs. This government is failing the future of our province. Can the Premier explain why his Minister of Education thinks the learning conditions of Ontario students are not his problem? The squad to recognize the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, what Ontario parents want is that their kids are financially literate and graduate with life skills in this here, province, here. which is here, why here. we brought forth a here, comprehensive here. plan today to do just that. You know, the Leader of the Opposition has a history of voting against every single investment in our school building fund. It was Premier Doug Ford who doubled the funding to build more schools, Madam Speaker, who cut the timeline in half, who actually achieved the Auditor General's recommended investment of maintenance funding. But the member opposite lacks the courage to send up to the TDSB, where many of her compatriots sit on, and insist to the NDP trustees at the board to actually do their job and invest the money in that very route. It is comical that you think it's acceptable they're sitting on $300 million when they ought to be investing it in our school system. They're the yes. only board to have done so. We pass a law to prohibit it in the future. It's unacceptable. We're standing up for students. Invest in our schools is our message to the TDS. Speaker, this government is running their own massive deficit, but they expect school boards to balance their budgets when they can't even do it themselves. That's the truth. That's the irony. Ontario is meanwhile facing a whopping $16.8 billion school repair backlog. And we know both liberal and conservative governments have left our schools crumbling, right? Students are left to learn under caved-in ceilings or in classrooms with garbage bins that are collecting the rain. We've all seen it on this side. Boy, have we. The minister can blame the school boards all he wants, but they, at least, are legally bound to balance their budgets. And it's basic math. When the minister Question. underfunds them by millions of dollars, they are forced to make cuts, and they are not going to be able to make repairs. So I want to ask the minister again, and the premier, when is this premier going to make his minister take some respon response? Response. the minister of education. You know, the NDP math makes the case that you actually really should be the first student for a financial literacy. Here, here. We're going to offer it to the leader of the, the member from Davenport getting a sneak peek on our graduation requirement because, my goodness, 22% increase in funding. We doubled the funding, 136% increase in capital. We added $1.3 billion of investment. We cut the timeline in half. Maintenance funding is encouraged or recommended by the AG at 2.5%, which we have done. But this school board specifically is literally sitting on $300 million of cash, so much so that they can 
conceded yesterday that they don't even have the capacity to spend it all because there isn't enough skilled trade workers to do it. Not a lack of money, it's a lack of will. Stand up to the school board and demand better for your kids. needs to take his own uh, financial literacy assessment test. The TDSB alone is facing a deficit of $26.5 million. In Thames Valley, classroom supplies are scarce amidst an $18.5 million deficit, the largest they've ever seen. Ottawa Carleton is facing $70 million in deficits. The minister says there's historic education funding, but a budget that ignores inflation is a budget that ignores reality. The only thing historic is the fact that our kids are now lobbying us to fix the roofs of their classrooms, to bring back soap in the bathroom, and to keep the lights on in classrooms. I want to ask the Premier, do we need to hire a lobbyist or reach out to you on Gmail to get some answers? First, I recognize the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, for the first time in 25 years, our province is updating the Ontario Secondary Diploma, giving it meaning and purpose in alignment with the labour economy, with the economy that's changing around us. We announced today a plan to introduce Ontario's first financial literacy graduation requirement that actually will ensure young people graduate with real life skills and practical knowledge on how to balance a budget, live a life of purpose, save and retire. Mr. Speaker, we announced a plan today to hold new educators to account, something the Leader of the Opposition would never do because they'll never stand up to the teacher unions, while we expect better from our new educators by imposing the math proficiency test, elevating standards, something that is radically different with the NDP, who wants to water us down and talk us down in this province. Mr. Speaker, we announced a plan to introduce home economics, a modernized version. This is how we restore life skills, job skills, and give young people knowledge they can apply in their lives. Questions for the okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. On May 10th, this to the Premier, on May 10th last year, this government's Minister of Health stood in this house and said, quote, the Minden Hospital is not closing, unquote. Yet two weeks later, on June 1st, they took down the hospital sign and they rolled the beds out in a minivan, and that hospital has been closed ever since. And the community warned this government that closing that emergency room was going to take lives. Last summer, a father had a heart attack in Minden. He was rushed in an ambulance to the next nearest hospital in Halliburton. He died of a cardiac arrest five minutes from the destination. A girl with a fish hook in her eye in Minden had to be transported 30 minutes to Halliburton. And two weeks ago, the Halliburton Hospital, the one remaining emergency room in the community, was without a doctor for at least four hours. Question. Will this government acknowledge its mistake and reopen the Minden Emergency Room? Thank you, Speaker. For a decade under the Liberals, supported by the NDP, the underfunded the health care system, closing hospitals and hospital beds, firing nurses and cutting medical school residency spots, Speaker. Our government inherited a health care system under severe pressure due to the actions of the previous Liberal government. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government has made record investments in health care, Speaker. We've grown our health care budget by over 30 per cent since we took office in 2018, with a record investment of $85 billion into our publicly funded health care system. Excellent. Speaker, continuing their legacy of not supporting health care across the province, both the Liberals and the NDP constantly vote against our innovative investments and bold Old action our government has taken to rebuild our health care system after years of neglect. Speaker, we'll continue to make the investments that are required to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system across Canada. Question. I recognize the member from Nicaragua. Speaker, Durham Hospital in West Gray is this government next Minden. On Monday, their emergency room will close 14 hours per day and all inpatient beds will be closed. West Gray Town Council had to declare a state of emergency. South Muskoka Memorial Hospital is going down the same path, looking at closure. And the hospital in Chelsea, Clinton, Almonte, Enfriar, Campbellford, Hawkesbury, Listowel, Mount Forest, Palmerston, Seaford, South Huron, Walkerton, Wingham, and their list goes on, are not far behind. How many rural hospitals does this minister intend to close? Thank 
Deputy Speaker, Ontario has some of the shortest wait times across the country, but we know there's more to be done, Speaker. As I mentioned in my previous answer, we have 50 hospital projects right now across the province, totaling $50 billion. Again, we're, ma we're making up for lost time under the Liberal government, propped up by the NDP, Speaker. Last year alone, we had a record number of new nurses, 17,500 new nurses registered in Ontario, with another 30,000 nurses enrolled in studying at a college university speaker but we're not stopping there we're investing over 740 million dollars to address the immediate staffing needs supporting the expansion of over 3,000 new nursing seats at Ontario College's University mm -hmm. Speaker. We also expanded the Learn and Stay grant, which the opposition voted against, which pays for tuition, books, supplies for nurses and other health care workers. Speaker. We're also funding the largest expansion of medical school spots in over 15 years with 1,212 undergraduate and 1,637 postgraduate seats. Speaker. The questions. I recognize the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question today is for the Minister of Energy. You know what? It's been two months since the federal government increased the carbon tax by a whopping 23 percent, and everything seems to be getting more expensive. Speaker, while the Liberals uh, like to blame everyone else for the damage they've caused, Ontarians know that their costly tax has driven the cost of living to record highs. The carbon tax queen, Bonnie Crombie, along with her Liberal caucus, continued to prop up their federal buddies' costly measure measures despite witnessing the financial hardship Ontarians are facing. And I hear this every day when I'm knocking on doors. On the contrary, our government has been opposing the carbon tax since day one. We want to keep costs down for Ontarians and deliver real affordability. Speaker, can the minister please Question. explain why the carbon tax must come to an end? Response and recognize the Minister of Energy. Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker, and thanks to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for the question this morning. This is the number one issue that we're hearing about across the province is the increased cost of living in our province, but also across our country and the impact that the federal carbon tax, supported by the Queen of the Carbon Tax, Bonnie Crombie, is having on their household bills. Uh, gas bills for their vehicles, home heating, grocery bills, they're all going up and they're all a result of the increasing federal carbon carbon tax year after year. Now, we've taken a different approach in Ontario. We're lowering the cost of living, the price of gas, taxes, fees. Uh, we have reduced taxes Response. across the province, and our plan is working. As a matter of fact, this morning, the Premier and the Health Minister and the Minister of Economic Development announcing another major investment in health sciences at Sanofi in North Toronto, Madam Speaker. Response. Well, thank you, Speaker. And as families across the province continue to see soaring prices for gas, groceries, and energy, many of them have cancelled their summer vacation plans. Even a simple road trip has become unaffordable as parents struggle to pay for the basic necessities of life. Speaker, this simply is not fair. Life is harder under the Liberal government and their flawed policies. The federal government and the Liberal members sitting in this legislature must come to their senses and give a break to Ontarians who just want a vacation this summer. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the carbon tax continues to hurt every single person living in this province? Response, I recognize the Minister of Energy. Uh, Madam Speaker, it is that serious and it is that dire for a lot of families across our province, particularly in rural parts of Ontario that don't have access to, say, a, a transit system or a, or a TTC. Now, now, we've done as much as we can to lower the cost of those folks in the GTHA to get around with one fare that the Minister, Associate Minister of Transportation has, uh, has introduced, saving uh, those who take transit up to $1,600 dollars a year. You know, we've cut the gas tax by 10.7 cents a litre here in Ontario, but at the same time, the federal carbon tax continues to drive up the price of the pumps, which makes it really difficult for people to get out and visit beautiful parts of our province, like Prince Edward County and Kingston and Essex and Windsor counties and northern Ontario, beautiful places like Kakabeka Spons. Falls, Madam Speaker, that are wonderful this time of year. It's the federal carbon tax that's making it more difficult for those people. We should all in this legislature be supportive of Premier Ford's motion to scrap that tax in Ottawa. The questions are recognized. The member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for the Premier. On May 14th, this government chose to silence the voices of survivors by sending Lydia's Law 
Bill 189 straight to committee without debate, claiming it expedites the process. Yesterday morning, I asked the chair at Justice Committee if they had received instruction to review Lydia's law uh, committee. The answer I got was no. They had, no, they had received no instruction. There is no timeline for when this bill will be called. There were 1,326 sexual assault cases thrown out of court in 2022. I hope that we can agree that rapists should not be walking free in the province of Ontario. My question to the government, why did you silence survivors on May 14th, and when will you call the bill to committee? Uh, it uh, honestly is uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, question from the member opposite because the member would know that members on all sides of the House would take this very seriously and to assume anything less really is beneath the dignity of every member in this place. The member who is a long-time member of this House would also know that the government does not direct committee business. The member would also know the member would also know, being a long-time member, that there is a subcommittee that works on each committee, and that subcommittee is made up of a member of the NDP, and it is made up of a member of the government party. So what I would suggest the member opposite to do is to reach out to the subcommittee member from her party on that committee to call a subcommittee so that they can bring a study forward. Now, I know that they have been working very closely together, in fact, the member of the NDP subcommittee, the, uh, the, the uh, member for kitchener hessler have been working very closely to put together a very thorough study on this, Madam Speaker, and I trust that they will get the job done. Uh, speaker, that is a pathetic response from the, yeah. the House Leader. This government is knowingly and deliberately starving the system and sending a message to survivors across and families across Ontario that they do not care about the lived injustices that women have experienced. If expediting was the goal of the government, why hasn't the, the, the committee been instructed to call the bill? If you had read Lydia's law if you had, and if you had read Lydia's victim impact statement, you would never have deferred this piece of legislation to committee where it is languishing. Lydia asked me, Speaker, why would women report knowing how broken the system is? This is our opportunity to correct that system. We need to change the justice system because the status quo isn't working and change begins with transparency. My question again. When will the government call the bill at committee so that survivors can get the justice they deserve in this province? Response. The government House Leader. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Again, it is the subcommittee and it is the committee which will decide the fate of that uh, of that study, Mr. Speaker. And I trust that they will do their job very well. But I need no lessons from the member opposite on respecting the rights of victims of crime in this province, Mr. Speaker. And to suggest anything else is beneath the dignity of that member. I have two daughters of my own. Do you not think I want them to be made safe, Mr. Speaker? Do you not think I'll stand up for victims of crime? And Every day, the member officers should know that I'll do that, and so will every Dundas will come to order. Question. I recognize the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The federal carbon tax continues to drive up the cost of the goods we buy and the interest we pay. At a time when prices are out of control, and people are having trouble paying their bills. The federal Liberals hiked the tax again by 23 percent. It's not fair, Speaker. We know that it's possible to improve 
on the impacts of climate change without forcing people to pay a costly job killing carbon tax. Exactly. The Liberals Good must reverse this tax feature so that Ontarians can put food on their table. Can the minister please share how our government is protecting the environment for future generations to enjoy without introducing a punitive carbon tax? Response, I recognize the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'll tell you what we're not doing. We're not driving 300,000 manufacturing jobs out of this province, like the former government did and which a punitive carbon tax have continued to do. Instead, we have hardworking members like the member for Whitby, who is building up his community and building up Ontario, building on transit. Uh, look at the, uh, this member takes GO Train Transit every day, and that's something, it's a vision that our government wants for all Ontarians. We're getting more cars off the road, more people into transit. But who was up to the opposition, the cost of these transit projects would go up. But no, uh, no fear, Speaker. Instead, this government will continue to build transit, and we'll lower fees by introducing the one fair uh, program for all Ontarians, so making it more economical to get more cars on the road into to transit. In addition, Speaker, just next door to the members' riding, we're building the first urban provincial park. But if it was up to the opposition, the cost of building this park would also go up. Question: I recognize the member for Whitby. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Speaker, our government continues to invest in the future of Ontario and create a legacy of environmental health for generations to come. Speaker, the people of Milton and the people of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex sent a clear message on May 2nd, a very clear message. They reject the queen of the carbon tax, Bonnie Crombie, and the carbon tax she supports. They and everyone else in Ontario want to see our government continue to stand up for them, to fight for affordability, and oppose the Liberal carbon tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is keeping costs down for hardworking families in Ontario without imposing a costly tax? Response, recognize the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the member is correct. Carbon crombie would drive up the cost of everything in this province, driving up the cost of Ontarians who want this summer to go camping in the great provincial parks which this government is building. Under this government, we're expanding and building more campsites, something many Ontarians have said loud and clear they want to do this summer with their children. It's an affordable activity, but, Speaker, if it was up to car carbon crombie, it would be very expensive to put uh, gas in these vehicles. But don't worry, Speaker, this government is lowering the cost of gas. We've tied 10 cents a litre. In addition to that, we're building the EV infrastructure by putting EV charging stations in our Ontario parks and making sure we're using clean, green steel uh, to build these electric vehicles, again, creating jobs and building up our economy. Thank you. I recognize the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over a month ago, I brought forward Bill 173, the Intimate Par Partner Violence Epidemic Act. The government sent it to committee instead of making the declaration immediately. They have yet to call it a committee, pass and enact it, or declare IPV as an epidemic. The 2022 Renfrew County Coroner's Inquest report had 86 actionable recommendations, 75 of which were for this Conservative government to implement. The very first one, declare IPV an epidemic in Ontario. More women continue to be killed in this province due to this government's inaction. Survivors, victims, their families, communities, municipalities, advocates, experts are all wondering, will the Premier declare today gender-based violence and IPV to be the epidemic that it clearly is? In fact, uh, this parliament agreed, and that is why this parliament voted unanimously to pass that, uh, that particular bill, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, when the, par when the parliament as a whole unanimously voted to pass that bill, we also went a step further. We said that we had to find out how we can make the system better for victims of crime. Mr. Speaker, we wanted to bring together not only ministries, but we wanted to bring in service providers who have told us that while there are a lot of services, often that is disjointed. We wanted to bring in the justice system. We wanted to bring in Crown attorneys. We wanted to ensure that not only are we just making a declaration, that we are actually providing better 
services for people. We wanted to look across the country, across our partners worldwide. What can we do better in much the same way that we did with human trafficking, Mr. Speaker? Response. Now, if the NDP are that afraid to work over the summer Member to try to do Mountain something Mountain effective here, to bring forward legislation that will make a difference in the lives of the people of the province of Ontario, like our human Member trafficking Mountain work Mountain has made a difference in the lives of people, not only in Ontario, but across the country, I feel sorry for that. Recognize the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to point out Bill 28, which was a direct attack on women, passed in four days through this government with no committee. No committee. Bill 124, eight sitting days. Another bill that directly attacked women in the province of Ontario. If you really wanted to take action, you would declare intimate partner violence an epidemic today and implement the 75 recommendations from the Rutherford County Coroner's Inquest. The Conservatives claim they won't declare intimate partner violence an epidemic until they have actionable measures, and yet for nearly two years they've had 75 recommendations from an inquest into the death of three women in Ontario. Nearly 100 municipalities have made the, direction, the declaration, and I have a letter that was sent to the government house leader and other government members Question. from the warden of Lanark County imploring the government to pass my bill and declare IPV an epidemic before the house rises in a few short days. Last week, Shannon Hickey, a 26-year-old nurse from Belleville, was killed by her partner. Response. Will you make the Response. I recognize the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, what we did is went a step further. Parliament passed that bill unanimously, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker. Unanimously, Parliament passed that uh, that uh, uh, that declaration. Now, at the same time, what Parliament said is that we have to make sure that it's not just a declaration; that there has to be work behind the declaration, and that is what progressive Conservatives are willing to do. We are willing to do the work behind making sure that victims and service providers have access to the absolute best system in the world. We're prepared to do that work. But if the Windsor Member West will just come simply to wants a declaration without meaning, well then I feel Member sorry for the Windsor NDP West and it highlights just why they are so irrelevant in the province of Ontario. This is an irrelevant party that has nothing to say. Question. I recognize the member for Kanata Carleton. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Hamilton Mountain is being warned. Inex the member for Hamilton Mountain has been warned. Thank you. To the member for Kanata Carleton. Speaker. Speaker, inexplicably, this government doubled down, saying that the retention and recruitment falls has been not warned, I'm going to call you to order. But be careful because if I hear a response like that again, you will be. I appreciate that. Thank you. As to the member, please ask your question. Thank you, Speaker. Inexplicably, this government doubled down saying that the retention and recruitment of doctors is not a major concern. Excuse me? 2.3 million Ontarians don't have a family doctor. Yet nothing is happening because we are told the cupboards are bare. It is true that this year's budget forecasts a $10 billion deficit. And it is also true that in the past six years, this government has added $86 billion to Ontario's debt. So the money is being spent somewhere, just not in health care. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier how he could possibly think that spending $1 billion to expedite beer and alcohol sales should be his priority instead of solving the family doctor crisis. Response? I recognize the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, to the member opposite, who I believe is on the record for supporting a carbon tax and thinking that's great for the people of Ontario. Well, that, that, that gives us a sense of where you're coming from. But let, let's go back. We ran in 2022 on a, a key promise to deliver convenience and competition to the people of Ontario. Madam Speaker, the people of Ontario spoke. They want competition. They want convenience. They're sick and tired 
of the Liberal deal that they put into place, a 10-year monopoly deal monopoly deal which gave higher prices and a monopoly to large foreign-owned companies. We, on the other hand, care about small businesses. We care about the people of Ontario. 7,500 jobs are going to be created by our change here in Ontario that we're putting forward. That's good paying jobs for the people of Ontario. Our GDP is going to grow by an estimated $200 million. New investments in infrastructure and cooling systems for various companies are going to expand. And it's most important, it's going to get. Question. Thank you, Speaker. So I get it. This is strictly a distraction from the truth that this government has no solutions for the many challenges facing Ontarians, no solutions for our aging, ailing public health care system. No solutions on improving housing. No solutions on safeguarding and improving public Minister education. Minister of Labour will come to order. This government has no solutions for overwhelmed Ontario families, children, seniors, or patients. Just giveaways to wealthy friends and insiders. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier once again, how could he possibly think that the priority of this government should be renegotiating beer contracts instead of investing in the solutions that Ontarians urgently need. Response. Recognize the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And, and, and let's be clear to the House here and the people watching on TV. We've made it a very big priority to hire doctors, create new medical schools in the province of Ontario, hire foreign registered nurses, bring them into the province. So that's very much a priority. But let's get back to what the member was asking about with respect to the liberalization that we are bringing in. The previous Liberal government signed a multitude of bad deals. I know the Minister of Energy could certainly point to the Green Energy Act, which was probably one of the worst bills ever signed in the, to the people of Ontario's history, but also the Master Framework Agreement, a 10-year deal which gave high prices, high taxes and high profits to foreign corporations. We are acting on the promise that we ran on in 2022, which is to give liberalization to this, stop the old Spons. agreement, 97-year monopoly, bring convenience and competition to the people of Ontario, and bring back economic growth. This is what the people of Ontario want, and we're delivering. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. The federal government's unfair, regressive carbon tax is forcing Ontarians to pay more for everything, from the groceries to home heating and gas. Speaker, families in my riding of Richmond Hill are concerned about the impact that costly tax will have on their loved ones. I have heard from long-term care operators in, my, in our province who say that liberal carbon tax is driving up the cost of building. As our aging population continues to grow, it is vital our long-term care capacity grows alongside it. As our eight Ontarians want an end to this tax, Question. and the federal liberals need to be on the right thing and scrap it immediately. Speaker. Can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to build more long-term care homes in Ontario? Response. I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for Richmond Hill for uh, her question and also for being such a staunch advocate for seniors not only in her riding but across the province of Ontario. Madam Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. As the minister and I travel across the province, what we hear from operators is that the carbon tax is increasing the cost of absolutely everything, including construction of new homes. And that is why in our recent budget 2024, our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, stepped up to the plate and invested $155 million to the construction fund subsidy. We talked to the industry and heard them loud and clear. However, the Liberals, surprise, surprise, voted against this Again. increase in funding well, to make sure seniors them. can receive the care they need. 
Instead of supporting our government's plan to build Ontario, they continue to support this cost-hiking carbon tax. Speaker, I stand with the Premier and I stand with the Minister who is making life easier for Ontarians, especially our seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary Assistant for the response. She is also as compassionate to all the seniors in this province. Unlike the NDP and the Liberal members in this legislature, our government understands the challenges of, Ontario, of Ontarians are facing. That's why we have been asking the federal government to scrap the carbon tax since day one. But, Madam Speaker, the opposition continues to turn a blind eye. They would rather support a costly carbon tax and does, not, and does nothing beside punishing families, businesses and workers. Despite that inaction, our government under the leadership of Premier Ford is getting it done for Ontarians. Speaker, can the parliamentary assistant elaborate on the work our government has been doing to ensure that our seniors receive the care they need and enjoy the high quality of life that they deserve. Response and recognize the parliamentary system to the Minister of Long-Term Care. After a decade and a half of the Ontario Liberals' hope and prayer, complete lack of vision, complete lack of investment into long-term care, we are finally getting the job done. And despite the work the federal government is doing to hold down construction with their tax on everything, we are still getting it done for the people of Ontario. In fact, we are not letting the carbon tax slow us down. Last year, we approved over 11,000 beds to start construction. Contrast this with uh, Carbon Crombie's record of failure as the mayor, where she failed to build almost any housing. Speaker, Mississauga is one of the only jurisdictions in Ontario that actually lowered under her leadership. She didn't build then, and she isn't building now. Speaker, we just can't afford her. Once more, I Spons. ask Carbon Crombie and her high cause Liberal caucus to join us and call on their federal Liberal cousins to finally give our people a much-needed break and scrap this tax. Questions? I recognize the member from Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Minister of Health. Today, thousands of concerned citizens are outside Queen's Park protesting this government's disastrous health care policies and privatization scheme. Among these citizens are residents of Port Coburn and Fort Erie who have now gone 330 days without after-hours services at their local urgent care centres. Speaker, nearly 10,000 residents in Port Coburn alone are without a family doctor, and many are forced to rely on their local urgent care centre. Through you, Speaker, when will this minister finally listen to the citizens of Niagara and step in to restore full urgent care services in South Niagara? Sponsor, recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. That's why we're investing in a new hospital in the Niagara region, Speaker. We're also investing in connecting 600,000 more Ontarians to an interprofessional primary care team, Speaker. The new and expanded teams will include family health teams, nurse practitioner-led clinics, community health centres and Indigenous primary care organizations. Speaker, I'll remind the member opposite, they actually voted against our budget that actually included $546 million expansion over the next three years to expand the inter interprofessional primary care teams. Speaker, the Minto Mapleton family health team has already hired a new nurse practitioner, and we're going to see more in the months to come. Speaker, in Ontario, we have a plan, and it's working. The questions are recognized the members of the Centre. Speaker, again in the Minister of Health, as a result of this government's failed health care policies and mistreatment of health care workers, residents in Welland have now endured a staggering 457 days without after-hours emergency surgical services at the Welland Hospital, a cut that Niagara Health said was temporary due to staffing shortages. With Welland's population surging and housing targets being surpassed by 276 per cent last year alone, we should be seeing a historic expansion of services in South Niagara. Speaker, through you, when will this minister listen to the people of Niagara and step in to ensure after-hours emergency surgical services are restored at the Welland Hospital? Response, I recognize the parliamentary assistant. 
Speaker, let's talk about historic. Our government is investing $3.1 billion in the new hospital in Niagara, Speaker. Once completed, the new hospital will consolidate five separate campuses and expand acute care services, replacing outdated infrastructure that the NDP allowed to crumble under the Liberal government. Speaker. Additionally, we're meeting the growing demand in the region. The new hospital is planned to have 159 more beds than the combined total of beds at the Niagara Health's Port Colborne Fort Erie and Niagara Falls campuses, Speaker. Well the minister recently met with Mayor Steele about the creative ideas they're exploring locally, Speaker. We will continue to work with all of our health care partners across the province to ensure that we have the best publicly funded health care system in the north, in the south, east, and west, Speaker. Question. I recognize the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker. For years, consumers and retailers have been urging the government to expand alcohol distribution policies to align with most other Canadian provinces and the U.S. to allow for an open market and greater convenience for consumers. Currently, consumers can only buy alcohol from a limited number of grocery stores. This often results in the need to make additional trips to make it inconvenient to pick up a bottle of wine before visiting a friend. Speaker, my question is, how will this expansion for retailers be implemented to create an open and convenient marketplace? Thank you. Response, I recognize the member for Oakville. Thank you to the member from Don Valley North, and I must say that was a very good question. In terms of the liberalization and the changes that we are making, it's going to have a tremendous impact not only on families across Ontario and individuals that just want to buy a bottle of wine on a Friday night and not have to go to the LCBO or the beer store, but it's also going to help small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of the province of Ontario. 7,500 uh, new jobs will be created in small businesses and convenience stores and other, other areas, so this is going to have a tremendously positive impact. In fact, I can uh, assure the member opposite that there has been great support from the convenience store industry. In fact, uh, the president of the Ontario Convenience Store Association has said, quote, this is great news for all convenience store owners and their staff in Ontario. We at the Ontario Fox. Convenience Store Association have been petitioning the Ontario government for beer and wine in corner stores for the last 30 years. We're delivering. I recognize the member for John Valley North. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the parliamentary assistance for his response. Speaker, in Ontario, a survey shows that 75% of youth in grade 12 and reported lifetime alcohol use. Based on research from Alberta, awareness and education campaigns can help shed light on alcohol-related harms. Speaker, alcohol consumption has surged post pandemic, especially amongst the youth in Ontario. Can the minister please tell this house what is the strategy to combat this rise, and what is this government doing to promote res responsible drinking? Response. Back to the member for Oakville. Yeah, thank, thank you, Speaker. Very good question. Uh, and uh, it, it's important to understand that the Ontario government takes this very, very seriously. So with the modernization, uh, the Ontario government is investing an additional $10 million in funding to support social responsibility initiatives and organizations that maintain uh, their, the rigorous standards of social responsibility. So that will include warning signs, mandatory staff training, and high standards for licensing and enforcement. Thank you, Speaker. For the questions, I recognize the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Businesses. Speaker, the cost pressures driven by the federal carbon tax have placed a significant burden on Ontario's small businesses and aspiring entrepreneurs. Young people in our province with innovative ideas are finding their dreams stifled by the increasing affordability challenges steamed from this tax. 
The carbon tax is not only driving up operational costs for existing small businesses, but it's also hindering the ability of these budding entrepreneurs to get their ideas off the ground in the first place. Our government must continue to demonstrate leadership in helping Ontario's young entrepreneurs succeed during their startup phase. Question. Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell us how our government is supporting aspiring entrepreneurs in our province who are negatively impacted by this disastrous tax? Response, I recognize the Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great colleague of mine from Mississauga, Erin Mills, for the question. Speaker, I've heard from so many young entrepreneurs who are finding their dreams of starting their businesses harder yep. due to the mo mounting affordability challenges caused by the carbon tax. Many tell me their parents are willing to help, but with the cost of groceries, gas and everyday essentials growing, there's just nothing left over to help them secure the necessary capital or invest in the supplies needed to start or sustain their businesses through the crucial startup phase. Our government recognizes the crucial role young entrepreneurs are playing in driving up our economic growth. That's why we've invested $1.5 million more into our summer company program for a total of $4.7 million a year, so an additional 250 young people can be their own boss this summer. Speaker, while we're making it easy for our entrepreneurs to get started, the carbon tax is making it harder. That for the questions, I recognize the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for this response. The Summer Company Program has an important role in supporting young entrepreneurs across our province, and I know many aspiring businesses, business owners in my riding were happy to take advantage of this valuable initiative. However, Speaker, the challenges posed by the federal carbon tax go beyond just affecting students and recent graduates looking to start their first businesses. Entrepreneurs aged 18 and older are also struggling with the cost pressures this tax is creating. And if it has become increasingly difficult for them to secure the necessary investments and resources to start or grow their entrepreneur enterprises. Speaker, can the Associate Minister tell the House what additional measures is our government using to support this vital demographic of business owners? Back to the Minister, Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member for the question. Speaker, I've been hearing similar concerns from more seasoned business owners who are grappling with the significant cost pressures this tax is creating as they seek to launch and grow their own business. Our government is taking proactive steps to bolster our support for all prospective small business owners. Just last week, we announced a $4.8 million investment over the next two years to expand Starter Company Plus program, which provides training, mentoring, and grants of up to $5,000 to help entrepreneurs age 18 and older start or grow their business. This will give an additional 500 entrepreneurs the opportunity to succeed, building on the over 5,500 companies it's already supported and the more than 6,300 jobs we've created across Ontario. Speaker, this Premier, this government's focused on reducing the barriers to starting a business, and the biggest one that still stands in their way is the job-killing For the questions, I recognize the member for the Thank you, Speaker. In St. Catharines, Shannon Horner's mother fell ill in Jamaica and couldn't make, come home due to claims of no available beds in Ontario. Communication failures between the ministry and the insurance companies caused this. We know that there were actual beds available at the time. I wrote a letter and was assured that it was being handled. However, I have yet seen any action. The healthcare system is in a crisis right now. How are you going to explain to the people stuck in other countries why they cannot get home for care? And will you work with me and update on the steps your ministry has taken to make sure it will never, ever happen again? Thanks. Recognize the parliamentary assistant to health. Thank you, Speaker. Critical Ontario is the uh, organization that is prepared to be able to handle people that get injured while abroad, Speaker. There was uh, a miscommunication there, and that, that member did come home 
Uh, but, Speaker, under a decade under the Liberals, supported by the NDP, they underfunded the health care system, which puts us in this situation. They closed hospitals, closed hospital beds, they fired nurses, and most importantly, they cut medical school residency spots, Speaker, which, uh, which leaves us with hundreds and hundreds of less doctors uh, performing services in the province of Ontario. Speaker, Ontario, our government inherited a health care system under severe pressure due to the actions of the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP government. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government has made record Spons. investments in health care, including a $3.1 billion investment into a new hospital in Niagara, which that member voted against. Speaker. The question is recognizing member for six Thank you, Speaker. I'd like that member across the way to explain to Shannon Horner why her mother fell ill in Jamaica. And yes, she did make it home, but she unfortunately has passed now. My condolences to Shannon. This happened twice in one week in Ontario and dozens of times over the years. It is heartbreaking that St. Catharines lost an amazing community member and a family pillar. It is time for action from this government. The minister called the family, but there has been no follow-up to the family. The president of Travel Health Insurance Association of Canada asked for changes. However, again, there has been no follow-up. Please follow up. My community of seniors, travellers, and snowbirds need assurance that their health care system will be there for them when they need it the most. Question. Speaker, when will we see real compassionate action and prioritize action with the experts to fix these issues? Back to the parliamentary assistant for response. Thank you, Speaker. The status quo was no longer working for the people of Ontario when we formed government in 2018. That's why we're taking bold and innovative action to rebuild Ontario's health care system to deliver more connected and convenient care. Speaker, The Liberals in 2015 removed those 50 medical residency seats, Speaker, that is now hundreds of less doctors in our, our system today. Speaker, since 2018, over 80,000 new nurses have registered to practice in Ontario, including 12,500 new doctors that have registered in Ontario. Speaker, Order. Over 2,400 new doctors were ready to practice last year alone, including 1,000 internationally Order. trained doctors, Speaker, Order. which the opposition voted against our motion to ensure that we Order. can have internationally trained Order. nurses and doctors practicing in our Response. province, Speaker. We're investing over $740 million to address the immediate staffing needs, supporting the expansion of over 3,000 new nursing seats at Ontario colleges and universities. Question. I recognize the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. The Liberal carbon tax is making life unnecessarily more difficult for people throughout the province. Due to the increased cost of goods and services, more Ontarians are struggling to afford basic essentials and make ends meet. Speaker, behind this record inflation and rising carbon tax, people are facing real harsh realities. And it's time for the federal government to finally listen to Ontarians and stop piling on even more financial burdens. They must scrap the tax now. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Liberal carbon tax is impacting consumer confidence in Ontario? Response to recognize the minister for public and business service delivery. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member for Thornhill for her excellent advocacy for her community and that very thoughtful question. Yes, the Liberal carbon tax is a major burden on families and households and our elderly and our young people and on small businesses, the engine of the economy. We must do all that we can, and we are doing as a provincial government all that we can to decrease the cost of living. Yes, my ministry has introduced the Better for Consumers, Better for Businesses Act, which ensures that price gouging will be recognized for what it is and declared unconscionable conduct. We have cut the gas tax. We have eliminated tolls on the 412 and 418 in Durham. Thanks. We have banned license renewal fees. So we're doing all we can, and we ask the federal Liberal government, and if the NDP supported us on consumer protection, call your federal cousins, tell them to defeat the Liberal government at Ottawa. For the questions, I recognize the member for Torn Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and for the solid work that he does for the people of Ontario every day. I'm glad to see 
that unlike the Liberals and the NDP, our government is actually listening to the concerns of the people who elected us. Speaker, Ontario has had enough of the Liberal carbon tax. After last month's carbon uh, hike, tax hike, commuters are being forced to pay more at the gas pumps. That's unfair to the residents in northern rural and remote communities and Thornhill, who rely heavily on vehicles for their work and to run their, their daily errands. The federal Liberals and the provin their provincial buddies need to start respecting Ontarians and get rid of this unnecessary tax. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the Liberal Western. carbon tax overlooks the varied needs and challenges experienced in communities across Ontario? Back to the minister for response. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank you for the follow-up question from the great member for Thornhill. When we talk about communities and how communities experience it, I can talk about my riding of Durham, which, as I have said many times, is a microcosm of the great province of Ontario. We have rural communities and farms in the northern part of Durham. We have suburban communities in Bowmanville, North Oshawa, and Curtis, and Newcastle. And all of my fellow residents and citizens communicate with me regularly about, for example, the increased transportation, energy, and operational expenses for our farmers the burden upon those who own homes or rent homes in terms of the energy costs impact as well. As I said, we're doing all that we can for our fellow citizens and residents to reduce the cost of living, but it's time for the tone-deaf Liberals and NDP in Ottawa to pay attention to our citizens and scrap this ruinous, regressive carbon tax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's all the time we have for questions. I'd like to...